Hi there, this will be a very short introduction to the European Union. Chapter 9, the EU and the rest of Europe. A most impressive aspect of the European Community Project has been its ability to develop and expand from a small group of relatively similar states in Western Europe into a European Union of much greater width and depth. The process of deepening and widening since the 1950s with its synergies and conditions contradictions have been recounted in chapter 2. With this long process of enlargement, its expansion to the Central and Eastern Europe that has been apart from de Gaulle's reaction to the British application been most conscientious. While member states generally agree that the Eastern enlargement was to be welcome to extend the area of prosperity and security there have also been greatly varying degrees of enthusiasm, to the point where discussion of enlargement fatigue become not uncommon in the old member states. Certainly there has been problems on the way, but enlargement can be seen as an essential part of the EU and its continued development, not least in its dealing with those who remain outside, and the treaty still affirms that the membership is open to any European state that respects the principles of liberty, democracy, and respect for human rights, fundamental freedoms, and the rule of law. There is a routine for the process of the enlargement. When an application is received, the Council asks the Commission for its opinion on the basis of which the Council may, and unanimously, approve for a mandate of negotiations. The Commission negotiates supervised by Council and eventually Treaty of Ascension has to be adopted by the unanimity in the Council with the assentment of the Parliament followed by the ratification in all of the member states. Membership can be preceded by a form of association. The original example was the Treaty of Association between Greece and the community in 1962, which provided for the removal of trade barriers over a transitional period, various forms of cooperation, and a Council of Association. It also advised eventual membership and various vicissitudes, Greece did indeed become a member in 1981. Portugal and Spain were not eligible for association in the 1960s. Their regimes were inca- incompatible with the community for which only democratic countries were suitable partners. And Portugal had already in 1960 become a founder member of the European Free Trade Association, which Britain had to promote in reaction to the establishment of the EEC in which being confined to purely trading relationship was not so concerned about the political complexion of its members. So when democracy replaced dictatorship in the 1970s and 1980s, both Iberian countries negotiated an entry into the community without any prior forms of association. This won why the negotiations were protracted from entry achieved in 1986. Protectionist resistance from French farmers in particular, was, however, more significant. The path to membership was different for more northerly members of the EFTA. The Brits, Danes, Norwegian, Swedes, and Swiss had eschewed the political implications of community membership, and the Austrians were preluded by their peace treaty. Britain, Denmark, and Ireland joined in 1973, without having been associated in any way. Bilateral free trade agreements were at the same time concluded between the community and other EFTA states, which Jen joined included Iceland and later Simon Finland, which joined in 1986 and Liechtenstein in 1991. As soon as the Soviet constraint was removed in 1989, Austria applied for EC membership Finland, Norway, Sweden, and Switzerland were not far behind. Dolores, hoping to delay such an enlargement, lest it dilute the community, devised for a proposal of a European Economic Area, EEA, to include EFTA countries, in which the EC in an extended single market. But the governments of those five did not want to be excluded from the decision-making in the community. So they all applied for membership which Austria, Finland, and Sweden finally achieved in 1995. After a short negotiation facilitated by their existing free trade relationship, Norwegians rejected association in the referendum and the Swiss voters refused to accept the EEA. 
So Switzerland continues with its bilateral trade free agreement and only Vestile EEA remains associated with Norway, Iceland, Liechtenstein within the Union. Throughout the Cold War, relationships were cool between the EC and the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union refused to accord the community legal recognition, seeing it as a strengthening the capitalist camp, and the community refused to negotiate with the Comic-Con, the economic organization dominated by the Soviet Union. Following 1989, the dissolution of the Soviet bloc, the Central and Eastern European countries turned towards the community as they saw the bastion of prosperity, democracy, and protection from the chaotic and collapsing Soviet Union. They nationally advised membership. The simplest case was the German Democratic Republic, as the Soviet-controlled part of Germany had called itself. The GDR became part of the Federal Republic of Germany in 1990, and the community made the necessary technical adjustments at speed so that enlarged Germany could assume the German membership without delay. For other countries of Central and Eastern Europe, extensive aid and development packages were put together under the Commission's leadership. Projects such as PHARE sought to provide assistance with the economic and political restructuring for the emergent democracies, spending roughly $600 million per the year 1990 and 2003 when it was wound up. However, such assistance, while welcome, was seen as many in the region as a divergent from membership. Indeed, such a view was accurate reflection of the ambience felt by many of the Union members about enlargement. While publicly proclaiming the historic mission of the Union to reunite Europe peacefully, many politicians were concerned about the admission of a large number of relatively poor, relatively small, relatively unstable new members whose population might move en masse to the West to find employment. It was in 1993 at the Copenhagen European Council that the Union agreed of the principle of offering full membership to those who wanted it. However, the Union also agreed for the first time to expand on the provisions of the treaty and laid out what became known as the Copenhagen Criteria. Stable democracy, human rights, protection of minorities, the rule of law, competitive, competitive market economy, and ability to take on obligations of membership, including adherence to the aims of political, economic, and monetary union. While the political union meant different things in different member states, the significance of the obligations of the membership was clear enough, including the huge task of applying for not short of 100,000 pages of legislation, mostly concerning the single market. To allay fears that widening would result in the weakening, there would also be the condition that the union should have the capacity to absorb new members while maintaining the momentum of integration. Despite this laying off of the threshold of membership, the development of extensive programs for assistance to the states of Central and Eastern Europe in order to help them meet them, it was only after the conclusion of the Amsterdam Treaty in 1997 that things really started to move. In 1998, the Union judge the first wave of five necessary progress in the negotiations began in 1998 with the Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Poland, and Slovenia, as well as Cyprus, which had also applied to join and in 2000, also a second wave compromise in Bulgaria, Latvia, Lithuania, Romania, Slovakia, as well as Malta. While the Union had indicated that each individual session negotiation would proceed at its own speed, it was agreed at the 2003 Copenhagen European Council that all, say, Bulgaria and Romania would be able to join in May 2004, and these two were able to become members in 2007. The process of enlargement to the East was very protracted, for a number of reasons. On the part of new member states, the adjustments required a very substantial, especially within the concept of emerging from communist planned economy systems. Many states simply lacked the institution, resources, and experience necessary to implement fundamental changes to the operation of many areas of public policy decision-making. On the part of the existing member states, we have already mentioned the fears about increased heterogeneity of the Union and its implications of free movement and the state of the EU policies. The last point was to take up the Union's time by the late 1990s that it struggled to reform CAP and cohesion policies to cope with the imminent rival of large number of poor states with significant agricultural sectors. Those reforms were discussed in Chapter 5. 
Seen broadly, the solution that was found to reform the policies by changing the type of support provided, but also to limit the amount that new states could claim in any case. Such an apparently unfair approach to new members has been a constant feature of all previous enlargements, as existing members seek to protect their interests while they can and an applicant state has little leverage to fight it. This was also evident within the discussions about institutional reform that culminated in the Nice Treaty, which a number of member states found unsatisfactory enough to call for the Constitutional Convention. For all this concern, perhaps the most remarkable feature of the post-enlargement EU is how unproblematic it seemed to be to date. Despite the failure to replace the Nice Settlement with the Constitutional Treaty, the Union's decision-making bodies have functioned with out under due problems arising from the enlargement and the gridlock that some had predicted in the 1990s has not come to pass. Indeed, when we consider the most oblivious cries within the Union, these have been more about old member states than new one. The French and the Dutch no votes on the Constitutional Treaty, the Anglo-French split over the Iraq War and its aftermath. Partly this because the new members have kept a low profile as they learn about the ropes of how to work within the Union, with Poland such something of an exception, but is also driven by depth of structural adjustment that these states have made to become members. Several of them have been more compliant with the requirements of these membership than those that have joined. Southeastern Europe denotes mainly the f- states of former Yugoslavia, Croatia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Macedonia, Montenegro, Serbia, and of which Kosovo remained a forcefully a province. Albania is also included with the term, but in current dismissions of EU policy, Sylvania is since not. Though it was also one of the former Yugoslav republics, it has qualified to become a member state. Before it disintegrated, the former Yugoslavia had been closer to the community than any of the other Central or Eastern European states. Then came the disintegration and the wars. The United States intentionally wanted the Europeans to deal with the problems. Jacques Poise, the Luxembourg's foreign minister and president and officer of the council in the first half of 1991, famously said this is the honor of Europe, not having a significant Serb minority, Slovenia secured independence without much fighting. But bitter wars ensued with Croatia, Bosnia, and later in Kosovo. In all three cases, the Union failed to complete much of Poise's claims. Instead, it was U.S. and NATO that were the main actors in securing durable peace settlement in the region and the EU being regulated to providing humanitarian relief. The key consequences for this union was to create a complete review of common foreign and security policy. Most notably, with the creation of hard military capa- capabilities in order to secure the so-called Petersburg's task of humanitarian relief, peacekeeping, and crisis management. It also helped to make the Union consider how its various external policies linked up together, most obviously seen in the creation of the High Representative to get a single face to the EU's work. As far as the Balkans were concerned, the result of the EU's initial failure was return to a drawing board and the reduction of a stability pact for Southeast Europe. This over arching set of policies designed to strengthen democracy, human rights, and economic reform was later followed by stability and association agreements between the Union and each of the West Balkan states, save so far Serbia. This is backed by the Union's instrument for pre-session assistance, which provides some $500 million per year for the West Balkans. With the slow stabilization of the region, the Union has been able to offer full candidate status to Macedonia and a provisional status to others with the stability and association agreements, thus providing a strong incentive for local politicians to follow the example of the other Central and East Europeans. The three former Baltic republics of the Soviet Union, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, declined to join Russia in the successor Commonwealth of the Independent States, CIS, and became EU members in 2004. Among the states that same with the CIS, six claimed to be European, Armenia, Belarus, Georgia, and Moldova, and Ukraine, and Russia itself. They couldn't, therefore, if they came to fulfill the conditions of stable democracy and competitive market, apply for membership of the Union. As the EU has enlarged itself to the borders of Russia and Ukraine, 
the question of enlargement to CIS state has been raised. The size of Russia, however, combined with the much greater economic and political disparities in the EU than those found in Central and Eastern Europe stand in the way. The policy has therefore began to develop closer and bilateral, multilateral relations rather than division and membership. The other states, too, face great difficulties. Although Ukraine faces major problems in becoming a stable democracy, the desire for membership is not in the long term unrealistic. The EU has ever been long been taken to the transition of democracy and free market economics through the CIS. In 1991 and 2007, the Union operated a very extensive program of assistance known as the Technical Assistance to the Commonwealth of Independent States, or TACIS, with a budget of $5 million, $500 million a year. TACIS concentrated on such things as enterprising reconstruction development, administration reform, social services, education as its biggest item, nuclear safety, which accounts for a large part of the regional programs, as we've seen in Chapter 10, TACIS has been superseded by the European Neighborhood Policy. The Union's relationship with Russia remains an ambiguous one. While the military rival for the Cold War is largely gone, the uncertain nature of Russian democracy under Vladimir Putin in the <coughs> new century has <coughs> created a point of tension. As Russia's military might has faded and the shift to a free market economics. It's not been as so successful as hoped, so the Russian government has started to use its massive natural energy exports to Europe as a new way of being a player on the international scene. The 2000s have been repeated instances of state-controlled gas and oil companies using their size and privileged relationship with the Kremlin to gain increasingly dominant positions within the EU energy markets, helped by the EU's own energy liberalization agenda. Well, this dominant Dominance is contingent by the fact that Russian companies are now dependent upon European markets for their profits. There is still more confidence in the political and legal systems in Russia. The Union is not likely to seek development in its relationship beyond current partnerships and cooperation agreement. If we cannot close this chapter without reference to Turkey, if Russia is a problematic partner for the EU, then Turkey has been more like a thorn in the side, because so openly and hardly wish to become a vendor for the Union for a long time. Turkey concluded a treaty of association with the EEC in 1964, which was like that of Greece, say the community's doubts about Turkey were reflected in a transition period of 22 years and no clear commitment to membership. Turkey, Turkey dodged its application for membership in 1987, but that was not until 1999 that the Union recognized it was as it as a candidate and negotiations only in 2005, association not expected before 2015. Even though the EU's low standards such as a protected process, requires some explanation. Union politicians have voiced a number of reasons for doubting whether Turkey should be a member. First, there has been reference to the Copenhagen criteria and the country's instability on grounds of human rights abuses, the role of military and politics, weakness in the economy, and the extent to which reforms can be meaningful made. Second, there are concerns about the size of Turkey, as it would be long be the year's largest member state owing to its high birth rate and the resultant potential for a large-scale migration to other states and for voting central in the council. There, third, there has been talk about enlargement fatigue and the more need for a substantial pause for a major expansion. Fourth, and perhaps the underlying of all inventions, is the notion of Turkey's otherness as a majority Muslim nation, as a state with tenderest claims to be geographically European as a state with very different historical past from that of current members, its challenges with many conceptions of what the EU is and should be. For the Turks' part, their persistence in the face of such opposition reflects the strength of Western Camellus project in the century. Its self-condition is a, as a bridge between East and West. Certainly, successive Turkish governments have made very extensive modifications to legal and political structures in order to secure the ascension of negotiations so they desire something that is more inspiring a lack of certainty in negotiations would occur. However, Turkish patience, especially in the general public, has not infinite. In recent years, there has been cooling and desire to join the Union. Again, there is a standard feature of enlargement. As the membership draws closer, people begin to see the costs as well as the benefits. Nonetheless, Turkey's membership remains unresolved. 
Bowing to public pressure, both Austria and France recently introduced new procedures that require referendums on the ascension of any new member state, which is highly unlikely to give Turkey membership. However, the question has to be whether or not excluding Turkey is desirable. The EU already has over 15 million Muslims, so religion is not the barrier that some should imagine. Likewise, in many Turkey, they could help consolidate EU's status as a global power, both through the mission of state that bridges into the Middle East and through its extensive military capi- capability. Where this decision is finally made, it will have serious implications for the Union and its future development.